children. Are they cold? Yeah. 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 I said this morning that it's cold in here. Yeah, it's it's not hard to deal with it. But it hasn't made any difference. Yeah. No, because there's nothing coming through here. Mm. I know, when I sit there, it, feels, it feels kind of cold coming mm. through here, but it's not. Well, hang on, it seems to be getting a bit stronger now, but it's cold. Can you feel it? Yeah, this, this is like. Breeze. Yes, but it's cold, isn't it? How long does this temperature take? Sorry? How long does this temperature take to come off? I don't know if they even work, you know. I'm always like ringing up or well, like ringing up all the email and email. Yeah, that's cold. It seems as there. soon as one gets cold, you know, one gets hot, and then they can't get them all at the right temperature at the right time. <laughs> okay, is everybody ready? Accommodation because I can't I mean what's supposed to go use the phone. Yet. No, it's fine. Jay's already emailed. Yeah. Yeah. My lady, um, just to pick up a couple of points from earlier, my lady asked for the reference to cross examination of Mr. Davis in partnership. I found it. Oh, it's not completely my fault. Well, you, it's I, right I, at the beginning. It is, and I, th I think it was clear from the, what the court had already said that they'd read it already. Yes, yes. And you, you have found it. There, there are, I'm told, other aspects of cross examination that touched on all sorts of issues that go to the partnership matrix, but they're not in the bundle, and no one's suggesting they're of any immediate relevance. Um, can I then, secondly, correct um, a legal submission on the ability of a party to put in a witness statement as hearsay? Well, I'm not, going to, look, I'm not going to look smug or anything. But no, but your, your ladyship was absolutely right. But, um, <laughs> since perhaps me and Mr Collins um, <laughs> <fault>. achieved, <laughs> achieved it, the Court of Appeals expressed the view that that's not uh, appropriate. The yes. case is the Property Alliance Group against the Bank of Scotland. Yes, well, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, paragraph 173. Uh, and, and in a sense, they, they say the rule refers to putting in the witness statement, not some of it. Yes. So effectively, what the party in paralysed position is asked to do is put to its election. Uh, does it want the plum with the duff or none of it at all? And in this case, whatever it thought of the duff, um, it took the whole lot and then stuck with it. So um, that's the position in the 
doesn't make any difference. So I was dealing with, um, just before the break, on the GAV issue. I, I think um, I answered the question about singular versus plural in judgment. And we were on the topic of the third way, the idea that, it, that a generally, accept, generally accepted views have not coalesced. Um, and what I wanted to do, just to finish that point off, was to make it clear what the commercial rationale for the provisions in the contract are, where there is no generally um, accepted set of views. Um, because an old master comes to, new to the market with no history, pedigree, publication, and so forth. It, it's obvious there it is likely, in all, <coughs> all other things being equal, that in that situation it's going to be hard for there to be a set of generally accepted views of scholars and experts at the top of the nation. And the, 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 the scheme of the contract, in my submission, makes it clear that where that is so, the buyer isn't being asked to take the risk of some of his description turning out uh, to be wrong and the work actually transpiring to be a counterfeit. Uh, Sotheby's is agreeing, uh, in the first instance, to put its balance sheet behind uh, the point and uh, agree that the contract can be rescinded and therefore that Sotheby's says it's contracted to the right to do so as against the third. Now that's entirely rational, of course, because Sotheby's has chosen to earn its commission on this case by describing it in the painting in the, in the contract <coughs> as a, a work by house. And if it turns out there isn't any proper consensus in the sense of behind the description, it, Sotheby's puts itself on the line to take the painting back and seek um, the, the money uh, to be returned. That's entirely <laughs> rational, and it's part of the reason why the Sotheby's authenticity guarantee is valuable, in particular to the buyer. But you mustn't forget. Sorry, so your point is that if there is no generally accepted view for the, in the circumstances found by the judge, then there's nothing uh, unfair about that because some of these will, commercially unfair about it because some of these will, will take the painting back. Yes, exactly. And, and that's what you'd expect. It's a rational way to allocate the risk in the circumstances of a new painting. Yes. And yes. it benefits both sides. Mm. I'm sorry, Mark. No, I was just going to say, I mean, if. If the guarantee didn't cover that middle ground, it's pretty hard to see what it would cover. Well, that's so. the point you made, and absolutely right. And the, um, it's up to Sotheby's to take the view as to how it would describe it. But on the other hand, it's up to Sotheby's to then um, commercially take it on the chin when it turns out it's not actually in accordance with generally accepted views. Yeah. And um, sorry, what you said, rational way to allocate risk benefiting. Both yes, both sides, my lady. It's easy to imagine that this is all just a buyer benefit. In other words, the buyer gets the assurance that if it turns out to be accountable and the various conditions are met, it's going to be able to get rid of the painting and get its money back. Mm. And the ex hypothesis will have overpaid vastly in almost all cases for the work. But it's a, the re, that, that is exactly why it's also a benefit for the seller <coughs> that Sotheby's is willing to put its name and its money behind the painting because it attracts buyers who are willing to buy it. And so, um, the value that Sotheby's adds by giving the guarantee isn't just for the buyer's benefit if it turns out to be counterfeit. It's for the seller's benefit if it turns out not to be, which in most cases it won't be. Mm. It's, it's a three-way <coughs> thing, again, and I uh, pray that in aid of my submission, that the guarantee looks both ways. There, are, there is contract B towards the buyer, contract A towards the seller, and they both get something out of it, which is a buyer who is more likely to want to buy the painting at a better price and a seller who then has to take it back if it's fake. Um, so the judge accepted my submission, uh, the, the, my, my um, predecessor's submission, of paragraph 62 of the judgment on construction, if you like. What he says there is, on what, a que what is a question of opinion, the words require that a generally accepted opinion has been reached. Sotheby's make the important point that it can take time after first discovery of a word to reach the point where there are generally accepted views of scholars and experts. And just note that he, he quotes the words. There's no doubt he knows what the words are. Now, Fairlight doesn't actually challenge that on this appeal uh, once you've got over the headcount construction or, 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 on the um, initial argument. They merely say that the judge's conclusion that this was such a case on the evidence was one that he shouldn't have come to. I'll come to that shortly and, and quickly, I hope. But can I, uh, I, and I've dealt with the 
the, the, the plural versus singular. So the judge then says, well, um, it, being, it being the case that it can take time to coalesce this uh, generally accepted new body of views, you then have to construe the words generally accepted views as ordinary English language in their context. R62 of the judgment. Again, absolutely nothing at all can be said to suggest that's wrong. It's clearly right. There was no disagreement at trial that, there was, uh, that these words are just normal English words. There's no term of art in the, in the art world that they seek to encapsulate. They mean what they say. And then, therefore, the judge said, I need to consider, one needs to consider for the purpose of applying the clause, and this is the end of 62, what type of view matters for the purpose of the clause. And he says it's, it's considered views and those which result from the application of the scholar's scholarship and the expert's expertise, if I can paraphrase it. And again, it's not obvious to me that 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 part of the judge's uh, conclusion, reasoning, uh, is challenged. I don't think there's an argument that he got that wrong once you're over the headcount point. So what the judge was obviously rejecting was essentially that you, you can list all available relevant scholars in a tally sheet, uh, use any, any available evidence whatsoever, whether it's known or unknown to the buyers or the sellers at the time of the contract, probably, and disregard the nuances of the view or the ways in which the views were formed or expressed and simply come to a view in each case whether it's a, a tick or a cross rather graphically illustrated in Mr. Collins' skeleton pre previous predecessor skeleton <laughs> and, and ignore all of that and just basically come up with a cross or a tick in, in the and uh, the judge rightly um, said that that's not right you can't do that views mean considered views views mean scholarly views and experts and can I just summarise what we say and we said to the judge, and I think um, it reflects entirely our case still, that those words in, in gen the generally accepted views of scholars mean uh, these things. In order, to, in order to be those, they had to be the product of genuine scholarship or actual expertise, not just an informal view based on incomplete or uncertain evidence, such as a photograph of unknown quality Right, they put a genuine application of scholarship or expertise. Yes, and not just an informal view based on whatever evidence happens to be at hand, but specifically including things like just a paint a picture. We know, for example, that Professor Slive's original view, um, when he said it could well may well be a house, if you remember that from one of the documents. Yes, based on a, it is known to be a black and white. There's, a, there's an issue. There was an issue of fact below as to whether he got a subsequent photograph from the um, but, but for example, that we say uh, his looking at that photograph and saying it may well be a house is, is, is meaningless because you have to look at whether he's applied his real scholarship to it. And one of the things we know from the evidence is that Professor Slive always wanted to look at the picture, the painting, and examine. Yes, I mean one would rather hope that goes without saying. <laughs> he'll pay he'll master attribution. Well, we would have thought so, but obviously that's not the case. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, he always wanted to look at the picture. The original, yes. Yeah. You said mm -hmm. photo, you meant picture. Yeah. Probably said, yes, well, if I did, my lead, I'm sorry, yes. I should say painting. Yes. And we're not in any doubt as yes. to which, what, which it is. Yes, you mean the physical object. Then. The physical object, yes. And, and the evidence was, uh, we say, uh, it's fair to summarise the expert evidence on, on the photo, on the judge accept, that it is acceptable to come to a scholarly view on a photograph, if you can rule out attribution. Yeah. There are some things that a photograph will show you that can rule it out. And that's why Professor Grimm could do so initially by photograph. But he also looked at it later and examined it. And he gave evidence to the judge and, and, and essentially said, the, the examination of the painting confirms my view that it was not a house. Well, Mr. Collins says this is wrong, and it, it's just a question for the expert as to the the sufficiency of the exercise yeah. is a matter for the expert. Um, if that expert is, feels able to express a view, then you run with that. Yes, but that can't be right in my respectful submission because that, de that devolves to the expert the question for the court, uh, or, or at least some of it is in the first instance, the court as a check, which is 
well, is that right? It's not enough for me to proclaim myself to be an expert and then to express a view. Objectively, I have to be an expert, and my view has to objectively be the product of an expertise that's recognised in relation to Franz Hallas. And then, uh, the, 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 the evidence also was that the three scholars, leading scholars, Grimm, Wiesbauer, and Sly, were the only experts actually on Hallas. The other experts were experts in relation to the period or the type of painting and that sort of thing. Um, and, and, and that's one other reason why, of course, you have to consider giving them more weight in certain respects than others who express the similar. Sleeve, Bauer, and who's the third one? Grimm. Grimm. So you have on one side Beast Bauer, who worked with Mr. Weiss and agreed it was a, a house. You have, on the other hand, Mr. <coughs> Professor Grimm, who said it was not initially by a photograph and subsequently after seeing it in person, uh, after the date of the contract. And then in the middle, you've got Professor Sly, whose views were the subject of heavy controversy. So that, that's, that was the basis of my original submission of divergence of views to start. Yes. So How many days worth of expert evidence was there? Um, that you've been sent it. Oh, I'm sorry, you haven't already received it. But I, um, there were. I started on the th day three and went into days four and five. So two and a half. Two to three. Two, I could only say two to three, my lady. <coughs> Um, but of course, I should have said, Ms. Professor Grimm appeared as a factual witness on the part of, uh, of Sotheby's. So there's also his evidence, which was the opening evidence on day one. The actual evidence. Can you just remind me whether Professor Grimm had actually seen the picture physically or not? It, at the time of the sale, he had not seen the picture physically. Yes. He saw the picture physically, I think, in July 2011. But the, and I, what, I, what I was coming to, I think I, I digress slightly, um, was that the experts did give evidence, or certainly Sotheby's expert and Professor Grimm, the, the effect of their evidence was that you can negatively attribute the photograph, reasonably confidently, but you can't positively attribute it. That was, the, that was the thrust of our case below. That's the case the judge accepted. There's no inter inherent tension at all. You can imagine why, why that may be so. I mean, obviously, the, the, the middle ground there is potentially... So where does he accept that in the judgment? Um, Six or five, he refers to it. Yes, and he concluded that he was not compromised by that. Um, whereas in Paragraph 64, all the evidence showed me that positive attribution is not a straightforward matter. Slide didn't see the painting in person. Um, a confirmed attribution without seeing a painting in person would have been a departure from his mode of working. Roy convincingly brought yes. out why seeing it physically was important. I suppose my, my lady's right to pick me up slightly. <clears throat> well, quite a stark, as he said. You're quite right. It's not quite an acceptance of that dichotomy. I judge that in the matter of commission, how it should be analysed. The judge was clearly struck by that point as a reason to conclude that the slide uh, hearsay was was not to be counted as an uh, no, endorsement, and not a reason to discount Professor Grimm's. Yes, and Dr. Roy, he was your expert. He was the Sotheby's yes. expert. Um, the, the other, <clears throat> so going back to what um, meaning by meaning of generally accepted views of experts and scholars, products of scholarship is my first point. Secondly, it was public. Uh, they, they have to be public in this sense, not not to the wide world, of course, but openly given, so that they could in fact be the subject of the sort of iterative dialectical critique of the other experts and scholars in the art world they inhabit. Because without, without it being out there and reasoned, the other experts couldn't say, well, that's good, bad, or indifferent. It can't be enough in our respectful submission that a potential expert, assuming they are, gave an opinion in a private email to a third party years ago 
that neither the seller nor the buyer is actually aware of, or in certainly not that the buyer isn't aware of, and that the buyer can't be aware of, um, it can't be enough to use that to, 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 to get over the hurdle of <coughs> generally accepted view. And one, one thirdly has to show, in my submission, and we'll go to this was one of the submissions that were open, that um, it is a direct expression of the relevant scholar and expert's opinion, not someone reporting a description that may or may not be accurate about what that person said, but that it can be safely and definitively attributed to the relevant scholar and expert. It's clear <clears throat> what was said and the quality and qualifications of it. Because in this case, as you'll have read, there are all sorts of speculations that the Professor X or Dr. Y had seen the work or had seen the photograph or had seen a good photograph or a bad photograph, what, whether it was a slide rather than a photograph, um, whether when they are s reported to have enthusiastically accepted the painting, that really means anything or nothing. And in our submission, you, you can't operate for the purpose of the clause that's intended to give an objective yes or no answer. Has the gap been satisfied? Why is it? You can't use this kind of disclosure material to piece a case together. Yes. I suppose another condition, perhaps we're going to come to this, is that the expert or scholar should not have any financial interest in the outcome. Ideally, and you may, you may say that. Well, I mean, more than ideally, I would have thought it's a, I mean, this is a well known pitfall from the days of Duveen onwards. <laughs> uh, well, I, 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 I would go as far as certainly to say that you you'd have to seriously weigh the opinion of an expert given in circumstances where they had a financial uh, stake in it. Yeah. I mean, it's not impossible, is it, that Professor Slive happened to own it and he was confident it was, was regenerate. <laughs> and you'd then sort of say, well, how much does that discount his view? But I agree. What, what, what this clearly shows, your Lordship's example, is that you can't just use a tick list because you have to look behind the view to assess the quality of the view in all its aspects. And in our submission, that's not just a matter of fairness to Sotheby's and the buyer and the seller. It's a matter of fairness to the scholars and experts because it, was an, it's an, it, it would be um, entirely unfair for opinions of scholars and experts to be sort of held out in public as determinative of an issue as important as this when they hadn't ever given that opinion in a, in a, in a formal, proper, considered and reasoned way. And um, you know, the risk, the risk of my own friends approach the case is that this, the outcome would be that oh yes, well Professor X um, was on the side of the house, but it turns out Professor X really only made a passing comment in his friend, to his friend in an email, and yet he's suddenly held out publicly <coughs> as endorsing the picture. Isn't there a risk of overcomplicating all this? Yeah, I mean it, one can throw in suggestions, but this is just that all the judge did. Paragraph 62 at the end. But the only thing that he added to the words generally accepted views of scholars and experts was generally accepted considered yeah. views. Yeah. Um, in other words, that was the, that, that was the contribution that he made to that. Um, isn't that enough? Well, in my, in my submission, it is. I, I, I'm, I'm going to move on. Um, if I, having heard. And then he then gave, gives his reasons at 72. Yeah. Exactly. Having canvassed in proper detail for the various issues, the evidence given on them, and his view as to where they lead you to the conclusion. Um, you can see he deals in terms with each of the individuals in issue. Um, I'll mention in a moment a suggestion that he didn't, but it's not, it's not a fair one. And he comes to the conclusion he does as an appreciation of the evidence and the weight of it, whether it's considered or not. So we do say that this is the case of an appeal against a finding based on a huge web of factual evidence properly assessed by the judge by reference to the correct test, which is manifestly not perverse. In fact, it's almost manifestly correct. Uh, and that's, they're shooting at the wrong target with, with this. So um, what we then have in the skeleton is, of course, the expert by expert traverse of all of the reasons that they say the expert gave a considered view, or gave a view at least. And our rebuttal 
and on an expert by expert basis of why the judge was right to decide that they either didn't or did or it wasn't clear. I don't perceive that it's going to be a useful time for the court for me to go through each one of those individually. If you, if you want to know the position of the parties on either any of them specifically, it's all set out very clearly in, in writing. Um, the, the one, the, the, the one expert that is said to have been overlooked by the judge, um, if I can simply re refer to him, it's said in my learned friend Skeleton at Power 49, that Dr. Ruloff was not mentioned, and the judges criticised for failing to mention him. But there, there was, in fact, no statement of attribution in the evidence from Dr. Ruloff. He was the curator of the Dutch Rijksmuseum, in which there was a house collection. And um, Mr. Weiss's hearsay evidence included a reference to his having shown Dr. Ruloff a photograph Dr. Rudolph being complimentary. That was the extent of it. So, <clears throat> um, it, it's a pretty weak point to start with, but you'll see in our skeleton the reference to the fact that the museum of which Dr. Rudolph was a curator in fact issued a press release later saying that none of its saying that its curators did not join the scholars who had decided that House had made the painting. Sorry, so this is paragraph 41. To, uh, uh, yes, 51 of your Exactly. Dr. Munoz's power 47. And it's responding to 49 of their right. But again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just really picking him out at random because he's the one that says there's no mention. But there are good answers in the, in the skeleton to all of those points. Um, <clears throat> there's a suggestion that my learned friend didn't pursue orally as to the um, fact that just should have was obliged to or somehow failed to draw an inference from, the not, from not calling Dr. Mr. Nauman. You see that in, um, in their skeleton. I, I, he didn't pursue it orally, so I'm content to rely on my skeleton argument to answer it. <coughs> so it's, it, it's paragraph 67 where the judge says that he accepted that. He accepted Fairlight's case that was an issue that was in, wasn't accepted, that Nauman was an expert, but Nauman hadn't, in fact, published any work on Nauman, <clears throat> and Nauman hadn't, had, had actually seen the painting. Um, but the, the fair like didn't criticise the judge for that. They say that because they infer now um, Sotheby's might have been able to call him, and he was party to an email in which he recorded Professor Sly as having enthusiastically accepted the house a year earlier. Um, some kind of adverse inference should be drawn against us for not calling Mr. Now, now you've seen well, you, you, this appeal to adverse inferences uh, from the non-calling of witnesses has become very common in high court proceedings in recent years. Yes. And we've put in the bundle uh, judgment of Mrs. Justice Cochrane. Like a cottage mm. industry. It, it, it has, and it, in, in, the, the authority is a tab 11. We don't need to go to it, but it's um, called the Rustem Magdeh case. And Mrs. Justice Cockle notes that as a trend and deprecates it. And she rightly does so, because what um, Fairlight do in this case, like many people do trying to get this sort of inference into the ground, is really not identify at all what it is that they say the inference goes to bolster. Uh, and what would have happened if Mr. Nowell had been called? We have the contemporaneous documents in this case showing that Mr. Nauman reports live telling him that he that, that, um, he'd enthusiastically accepted the painting, uh, so far as that hearsay evidence goes. We had in evidence the fact that Mr. Nauman had redrafted that email following correspondence with Mr. Weiss to give it a bit more sales puff, if I can put it that way, the, the, the references in our skeleton. And so you have you have the evidence that you need. The judge had the had the evidence he needed to form a view. Um, that was what was reported. That's what it is. The judge looked at it, he weighed it, and decided it didn't mean that Mr. Uh, was a source by which Mr. Professor Slide could be said to have given a considered expert point. So 
We dealt with Mr. Now and expressed the judge. Yes. Did at sixty-seven, at paragraph seventy, I think. Maybe. He also said at the end, "I had sufficient evidence." It, I, I don't consider I had insufficient evidence from some of it. It picks up a point that Mr. Justice Cockrell makes in that case, which is that, of course, each side decides at the beginning of a case who they're going to call as witnesses. And um, things move on. You can't possibly criticise people for not calling someone but on every point that there might have been some <coughs> benefit from hearing them. Just because by the end of the trial, one, one wishes, or one side wishes they might have had the opportunity to cross examine them. The <coughs> point is that. On this issue, it was clear what he said, the slide had said, it was clear the context in which he said it, um, trying to help Mr. Vice, <coughs> and the judge made of it what he thought he could, and that's a, an appreciation he was perfectly entitled to make. And in general, economy is a vice, and, oh, is a virtue, not a vice. Yes, and we are, we are in, we, yes, You'll see, you must see of all people the, the way in which no stone gets left unturned by people arguing every single point. And, um, with all due respect, that is to be deprecated, where the points are bad ones. Or not a necessary one. I'm probably as guilty of that as the next person. Um, but I don't think there's any point now made about conflation of attribution and authenticity. It wasn't mentioned by my learned friend. There's absolutely nothing in it. The question was, was it a house or was it a fake? Um, or was it not a house at all? The same point. Um, yes. Not, none of that matters. Um, can I then turn to subsequent owner point, the very final issue on the appeal, unless um, any uh, of the court has a gap. I don't think so, thank you. Um, we can take this fairly quickly, as I think Mr Collins uh, accepted. Um, it, it's clearly, um, was clearly correct to, correctly decided in sort of his favour by the judge. Especially, I should say, when the two halves of the, of the contractual picture are put together in the form of contract A and B, as two halves or two, two limbs of the triangle that I described as an earlier appeal. So you have contract A, page 57 of the, of the core bundle, in the private treaty terms annex, <coughs> providing, as Mr. Collins said, that the guarantee will not be assignable and will only be applicable to the original buyer and not to any subsequent owner or owners who acquire interest in the property. And with, with all due respect, that is absolutely and unequivocally clear that it applies to the original buyer. And the only question, therefore, is who is the original buyer? And the only answer is EPC Nevada LLC, which is the only party <coughs> reported to get, uh, uh, invoke the guarantee in whose favour the money was returned. Now, the fact that, the, that Mr. 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 Collins says, ah, but there are superfluous words in here, if that's right, because it says it will not be assignable already. But they're not superfluous at all, of course, because imagine that a painting, um, the buyer, had charged the painting in favour of a bank. Oh, just slow down. Imagine oh, the... Right. The buyer of the painting, Nevada in this case, had not sold the property, and therefore there was no subsequent owner, but it had chosen to charge it or mortgage it or pledge it as security, uh, and the pledgee, or equivalent person, had said, yep, yeah, on the side of Sotheby's right guarantee, so that I'm protected if it turns out to be a fake. What this clause says, you can't do that. Um, but that, that means that that, pro that prohibition has <coughs> meaning completely separately from a possible subsequent sale. Uh, if Sorry, I I, it's just my fault. I don't follow that. Um, the <coughs> Sorry, no, no, it's, it's my fault. So Mr. Collins says it must mean something different was otherwise there was already in contract A a non assignment. It's part of the same sentence, in fact. Yes. yes. Will not be assignable and will only yes, be exactly. and will only be. Um, and, and why do you say that uh, why do you say his argument doesn't work? Because there are circumstances one can realistically commercially envisage where sort of would want to prevent an assignment <laughs> short of uh, a sale to a subsequent owner. That being, for example, someone who took a security interest over the property and tried to demand from the buyer mm -hmm. a, a, um, an assignment of the guarantee, which is hardly fanciful if you know the terms of the contract. So it has meaning, potentially. But even, even in any event, um, 
an appeal to superfluity is one of the very last uh, construction arguments that really would work in this case, where the wording is absolutely unequivocal. I mean, very often things are put in just for the avoidance of doubt or to right. bring home a point which might otherwise be possibly con conceivably regarded as controversial. Yes, it's a belt and braces. Um, perhaps, a, is it perhaps a further point. I mean, assignable is, is it perhaps needs to be distinguished from transmissible. So, I mean, the guarantee could, I would imagine, be for pass to one's personal representatives or one's trustee in bankruptcy. Yes. By operation of law, even though it's and that would not involve an assignment. Assignment. Yes. So, so Mr. Collins has done a clever job trying to think of some reason this doesn't fly, but superfluity isn't the answer. I'm afraid. Um, and actually, it's absolutely clear what's happened when you look at contract B and marry together the, the, the mirror image. Because as uh, you'll see from page 60 of the core bundle, that document, as far as the buyer is concerned, says in terms, this offer to rescind is only made to you personally and may not be transferred or assigned in any way by you. Those are the wordings on, wording on page 60. And so you don't, you don't even get the problem that there's a reference to a subsequent owner. What they're saying, as you can clearly see in this package of agreements, is that it belong, this right belongs to a single person. That is you, the buyer. And so when what happened, as we now know, um, Nevada transferred the beneficial, the ownership of the painting to Mr. Hedroon personally, we know from these clauses that Mr. Hedroon couldn't have got the benefit in any way, <coughs> shape, or form of the guarantee. Um, it was made personally to Nevada. What, what happens when it's given back to Nevada is, of course, they remain the person to whom it was given personally, and the original buyer in, in terms. And, and, and can I just, again, as I think one always has to do with these contracts, in my submission, look at the commerciality of this. Um, imagine, Mr. imagine Nevada was another art dealer who was looking to buy this painting to uh, resale at a further profit. It would be entirely expected, objectively, that that buyer, uh, that, that, that Nevada, might have to guarantee, in turn, the authenticity of the painting. Might choose to. Might say, well, I can really, I, I'll tell my buyer that if it's a fake, I'll give, I'll give them the money back. If that, that's not, not, not unrealistic. But on my learned friend's case, if that happens, then Nevada once the sub-buyer rescinds because it's a fake, is left with absolutely no remedy against Sotheby's, even though everyone contracted on the basis that the original buyer had that guarantee. And that would be an absurd commercial position for a buyer to put itself into. And it can't have been what Sotheby's and buyer intended. And it's especially um, unattractive as a point where we know uh, effectively that the, the only transfer that did happen SPV and beneficial owner and back in a purely formalistic technical terms. Uh, those are my submissions on subsequent owner, uh, and unless I can assist you further, I might say. No, thank you. Yes, Mr. Zuha, I'm sorry you're having to address us at such long range. But <laughs> nice to have this view again, my Lord. <laughs> no, it's not. It's so long. I wonder, I wonder. My Lord is just wondering about possible difficulties on the transcript. There not being a microphone. Ah. But I mean, I would have thought, after all, it's not unusual for junior counsel to address this court from the back row. Um, my Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my voice Perhaps up. Perhaps you would try to keep your voice I'll up. I'll keep my voice up. And, uh, the I don't know whether the transcribers are in communication with Sparta, but it may be that if they are having any difficulty, they can send a message yes. to the, uh, one of the firms of solicitors who will be able to Thank send, uh, send messages. Yes. Uh, uh, my Lord, my Lady, uh, on behalf of, of 
MWR the second, the second respondent. Lord, we, we adopt and support the submissions made by the first respondent, Sotheby's, in relation to grounds one and two, privity and partnership. Uh, th those being the issues uh, on which in the main proceedings and in the part 20 proceedings, our position differs from that of Fairlight and which, following our settlement with Sotheby's, uh, remained key issues as between Sotheby's and Fairlight, uh, potentially affecting uh, MWL uh, con consequentially in the Part 20 proceedings. Uh, uh, Lord's Lady, we, took, we took no position at trial on the GAV issue, the generally accepted views issue, or the subsequent owner issue, having settled with Sotheby's, and we, make, we take no position on grounds three and four uh, accordingly uh, on this appeal. Uh, Lord, on grounds one and two, uh, I want to add to my own friend uh, Mr. Pillow's submission only briefly. He, he has addressed uh, privity from the perspective of Sotheby's. Uh, it was uh, obvious uh, commercially uh, and legally that in the complex of contractual arrangements that are represented by contracts A and B, Sotheby's would, would need to, uh, intended, and did contract with the owners of the painting who were consigning the painting to Sotheby's and selling the painting under those contracts. The position was exactly the same from the perspective of MWL and indeed Fairlight as owners. They needed to intended to and did contract qua owners of the painting with Sotheby's to consign the painting to Sotheby's and to sell the painting. My no friend Mr. Collins started his submissions by saying that there were five agreements uh, in play, but his traversal of what he called agreements, I put that in inverted commas, was not a description of five separate contracts, uh, but in relation to the contract with Sotheby's was an extraction of only parts of the effects of the contracts, contracts A and B, uh, actually made. Now that, that was an attractive way of describing the complex of arrangements, and, and they are perhaps, one has to recognize, they are perhaps a complex if one tries to give a comprehensive description of all the relationships and all the agreements in play, including the acquisition of the painting by the co-owners, Fairlight and NWL, the consignment uh, of them, uh, the consignment of the painting to Sotheby's, the sale to EPC Nevada, the various uh, agencies in play to achieve that, uh, partnership or the precise nature of the relationship Co-owners. There is a complexity to, to doing that, and therefore a complexity in trying to give a single comprehensive description of all the relationships. But by doing it uh, in that way, and not doing it by reference to the two contracts, contracts A and B, which are at the heart of the appeal, it masks the relative simplicity of the central privity issue, because contracts A and B uh, as my own friend Mr. Pillow has shown, uh, do several things. They are not commercially or legally binary as to party or as to obligation. They create, in each case, a number of primary and collateral rights and obligations. But the privity question that the judge had to address involved asking essentially whether Fairlight was qua co-owner party to the contracts in the same way that MWL qua co-owner was party to them. Fairlight's pleading case was and, and was always that it was party to no contract at all though admitting that the painting was sold by Fairlight and NWL, and that that sale was authorised. Well, you, uh, on behalf of NWL, 
have always put this transfer point at the forefront of your submissions. Absolutely. You had a title pass. Indeed. We've always put it at the forefront of our submissions. And based based upon what has been from start to finish, or from start to finish, MWL's case, both both by way of defence to the claim to, uh, to the claim by Sotheby's and <coughs> Part 20, uh, that the, the, the two contracts were entered into by MWL and Fairlight as co-owners uh, to, uh, to, to achieve the sale. Now, and what my friend Mr. Collins did not identify as one of the agreements, and again I put that in inverted commas, uh, what he did not identify as one of the agreements made, uh, and, and using that term in the way he did as not referring to a single or entire contract, what he did not identify was the agreement to sell the painting, which one might think is the anchor and the one indisputable legal and commercial foundation of all the arrangements and of both written contracts. In other words, the one thing which indisputably happened and was admitted by Fairlight to have happened was that Fairlight and MWL as co-owners sold the painting to EPC Nevada. So Fairlight and MWL must together have been co-principals, party to the contract or contracts that achieved or amounted to that sale contract. Now there are two contracts by which that was achieved. Consignment to Sotheby's and sale by Sotheby's on behalf of the owners to EPC Nevada under contract B. And one can test it in this way. If they had been collapsed into one contract of sale with Sotheby's party to that contract and giving the same collateral guarantees in that contract as it gave under contract A and B, it would have been impossible to argue that one of the co-owners was not party to that contract of sale. And if in such a single contract the seller had been named as MWL, that would have been, but with MWL and Fairlight as co-owners, that would have just been an example of, of a contract where there is an unnamed co-principle. Uh, it would have been an example of one principle contracting with authority for both principles without naming or identifying the uh, other co-principles. Now, the fact that <coughs> Sotheby's wanted, uh, understandably, to keep buyer and seller apart and to interpose themselves into the sale, and by interposing, by interposing the sale, I don't mean by Sotheby's themselves buying or selling, but interposing in the sense of the splitting of the contract of sale into two contracts, but the adding to the contract of their own collateral obligations and corresponding rights, so that the contract of sale is now achieved across two contracts in, instead of one, that could not have the effect somehow of changing the capacity uh, or the legal position of Fairlight being one half of the co-owner uh, legal relationship vis-a-vis uh, -vis the contractual arrangements achieving the sale. On the contrary, uh, we would say that it reinforces uh, the obvious position that the splitting of the contract of sale across two contracts and the interposition of Sotheby's simply meant that the co-owners contracted with Sotheby's and the buyer across the two contracts. So that where contract A is addressed to MWL and refers to seller and owner, one reads MWL and Fairlight being the co-owners, and where contract B refers to seller or owner, again read uh, MWL uh, and Fairlight. So, uh, if correctly analysed, it is completely unnecessary to parse the multiple agencies in play which achieved the making 
of the contract. That, that is just process or, or, or mechanism. Of, of course, Mr. Weiss, Mr. Weiss, the individual who signed contract A, did so as agent for MWL, and he, Mr. Weiss, had been authorized by Fairlight to deal with Sotheby's on behalf of both Fairlight and uh, MWL. But that simply means, the, the significance of that simply means that there were no want of authority issues uh, in, in this case. But the question the judge had to address was to consider who was party to the contract, which involved addressing the substantive rights and obligations they created, and the agency mechanism by which they were concluded uh, is irrelevant. Uh, or, as the judge put it rather more gently, but nonetheless accurately in paragraph 22, in my judgment, the authorities cited on sub-agency do not engage. Now, MWL's uh, pleaded case and case at trial, so far as was necessary to, to advance post settlement, was that the, the legal position of MWL and Fairlight as co-owners vis-a-vis the contract was identical. They contracted together with Sotheby's to consign the painting to Sotheby's, and they contracted together to sell the painting to EPC Nevada through the contractual arrangements made with Sotheby's. And we say that the learned judge's rejection of Fairlight's no privity at all case well, was obviously correct. For, for the purposes of the issues on appeal, as argued, in our submission, it matters not whether you approach the legal question created by reference to the sub-agency papers by saying that on analysis they don't arise, as the, the judge said, or by saying that there is, to use the language of, of those cases, by saying that there is a special factor here, which would be co-ownership, which distinguishes their application, or which is the special factor which created. Well, it's only, it, it only doesn't matter because it, it achieves the result that you want. But actually, as I understand it, you, you advocate for the first um, interpretation, the judge's interpretation, rather than a sub-agency slash exceptionality argument. I mean, you're, you're, you're not saying that's the right an analysis. I'm saying that you're also right, but I'm, but I'm also saying the reason it makes no difference is because when, when there is reference to special factor in... in yes, but it's still, I mean, you might get to the right place, but it'd be the wrong road on your submission. It would, but, but Lord, if, just, to, just to finish the point to say why, why in fact, it, 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 they're just two routes to the same point. Because it, if, if the special factor is the co-ownership, the point being but, that it's... But it's, but it's not a sub-agency on your submission. So, right. I mean, you know, you, you, you point the road out, it's there, but I don't understand you to travel it. When your submission is an Occam's razor submission, which is you don't multiply entities. There's no need in this case to multiply entities. There's no need. I, 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 but I, I, but I, go a bit, I go a bit further in the sense that the, 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 the accommod I, I was attempting to accommodate what I understand in, in a sense, maybe just for the uh, apologies, if it's, as it were, for the, for the intellectual satisfaction on it. But the, the, the point being that if, if one considers what is it, when, when those sub agency cases talk about the special factor, what, what are they referring to? They're referring to something in the fact which gives rise to privity beyond the sub-agency. And my point was simply this, that it, what it is that gives rise to the privity is, is the co-ownership. The co-ownership makes them joint principles. Makes them joint principles, and exactly so. And, and, that is, and, and thereby gives rise to the privity with Sotheby's under those contracts. So, so, so between the, the two of you, I mean that nicely. So Mr. Um, uh, Yes, so some of these go for complete delegation. That would be, it says, if it's a sub-agency, which it's not, then this is a complete delegation, and that's one of the exceptions. And you say, if it's sub-agency, which it's not, there's a special factor. If, if, it, if, it's, if it's necessary or appropriate yeah. to try and put these facts <coughs> into the language that are used in sub-agency cases. 
then uh, then what one is identifying <coughs> as as the, the special factor is is the co-ownership which gives rise to that. But but I do say that that's, that in fact your start one is starting in the wrong in, in the wrong place. And I do say that um, uh, uh, that the, the the fact that there is agency at all and there undoubtedly is mm. uh, it is is all about the process of the making of the contracts. One can look at the relation to how the contracts were made. Uh, at, at different levels, uh, uh, entities and individuals who are acting as agents. But that is not to the point. Now, uh, 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 and, uh, and, uh, and therefore, it, it, it matters not whether it, it's correct to say that within the mechanism for the making of the contracts, Sotheby's was uh, technically a sub-agent and MWL and an agent for the co -owner. That doesn't go to the Whichever way one looks at it, in our submission, there, there was no, there was simply no error of law in the judge's approach. The question he had to decide was one of applying established principles that were not in this to the facts. And, and we say that his conclusion was the obviously correct one, but in any event, uh, for the purpose of appeal, there is no basis for saying that the judge came to a conclusion uh, for which he could not uh, reasonably come. And do you also say, as a matter of fact, it was necessary for the judge to find, as he did, um, that um, Fairlight had authorised MWL, your client, to enter into the contract on behalf of both of them? Uh, yes, but, but authority was not, was not an issue. There, there, and, and that, in other words, the, the, the tension in Fairlight's case yeah. was created from the start by its position whereby it accepted that the entry into uh, of uh, contract A was authorised. Uh, at, it describes it in the pleadings as the sub-agency agreement. That is a reference to the document, which is contract A, which it says was entered into with its knowledge and consent. Yeah. At, likewise, that the sale was authorised. In other words, thereby the, the position being that there was no issue of, of want of authority in relation to, uh, to, to the sale being seen mm -hmm. by it. it then goes on to deny as showed you, to deny that there was any uh, privity uh, of contract. Uh, and we say, as, as we have always said, that that, that created an impossible uh, tension within Fairlight's position, that the, the, two, the two could not uh, uh, sit uh, together. Uh, and the correct resolution is uh, that, and could only be, uh, that by, by the acceptance that there was authority to enter into those contracts, uh, the position must be uh, must follow uh, that the uh, that Fairlight and MWL were co-principals in relation to those contracts. Uh, lords, can I just um, take a, a, a moment? That that is essentially the, the submission that uh, uh, I wanted. Can I just take a, a moment just to clarify the position in relation to the evidence? Yes. Uh, and uh, and uh, in so and in, in particular in relation to uh, Mr. Weiss's evidence, which I um, and I want to apologise because there is a, 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 a an error and a confusion in the in fact in the in the bundle which uh, uh, which we should have. The position is slightly procedurally complicated, but I think uh, it will help you, uh, you all should my age, at least just to uh, understand how things uh, develop. Uh, Mr. Uh, pr prior to settlement, uh, uh, and at the time for exchange of uh, witness statements, we, we had uh, served uh, witness statements, the first and then second witness statements of Mr. Weiss, which were the statements of his evidence for trial. Then you served another one post-settlement that consolidated them. It, it, 
That is exactly so, my lady. So the reason, the reason for that was that obviously the uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Weiss's first and second statements contained evidence that uh, we intended to call and rely on by way of not only covering uh, matters in, the, in relation to part 20 proceedings, but also by way of defence of the charge of claim. Following settlement, the only matters in issue, therefore, uh, at trial were in the part 20 proceedings. So, uh, as your relation says, so we served then his third witness statement, and we called it uh, MW3, which was confined to evidence relevant to the part 20 issues as between MWL and Fairlight. Uh, now, uh, that meant that um, uh, we, and, and, and we made this, uh, we, we, we made this clear, uh, I think on uh, day two of the trial, uh, that uh, we were not adducing the uh, uh, MW1 uh, and MW2, and also made clear that MW3 would not be adduced in evidence unless and until uh, we called Mr. Weiss, and we indicated that we had not yet decided whether we would do so. There was then, as, uh, as the, the court uh, will know, there were, I think on just about every morning of the trial, day one, day two, and I think day, day three as well, some procedural uh, spatting about the scope of, of fairly 20 case that it was permitted to advance. The end result of that, following the rulings of the judge, was that uh, we were able to take the view that because of the, as we said, the correct confinement uh, of the case that Fairlight could advance in the Part 20 proceedings, uh, and the fact that it was not able to advance a new case in relation to fault uh, or negligence uh, of uh, MWL, that we did not need uh, any evidence uh, and didn't need to call Mr. Weiss uh, in order to advance our case in the Part 20 proceedings, which was, as we had made clear following settlement, simply that uh, any allocation of responsibility should be on a 50-50 basis. So, uh, and the reason, therefore, was that I say uh, that there is an error for, for which I apologise is that in the supplemental uh, you have at uh, tab uh, six, page 170, uh, you have an uh, extract from the third letter statement. Uh, but the third letter statement was never part of the evidence. Uh, what you uh, what you therefore uh, need in terms of the relevant parts of uh, Mr. Weiss's uh, witness statement in relation to, this is evidence in relation to his dealings with the poets, the 17th of May uh, email, and also in relation to partnership, are those parts of the first witness statement, which I'm afraid are not all at the moment included, um, which uh, then... Uh, so this is the one that Fairlight put in, the first one, not the third one. Exactly. So the third one was never reduced. The third one was never reduced, but the third one consisted only of material that was in the first statement. So, uh, for good order... Um, so, so for, for example... Yeah, it, it reads very... Yes. So, I, I think... Um, if you, if, you, if you go to page 175 of the bundle, uh, and you have, this is in the third statement, you have paragraph 31, which is a paragraph dealing with the 17th of May 2011 email. At the bottom of page 175, paragraph 31. Mm -hmm. for, for good order, Correct position, in other words, the, 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 the evidence that that, that evidence uh, in terms of what was evidence in the trial uh, is the is, is not the third statement because that wasn't part of the evidence, but the equivalent paragraph from which that was uh, derived that was in the uh, first statement, uh, which uh, you now. It's not paragraph 
unless you receive. Uh, in any way that I over the for the journals, I did receive I mean, uh, my my colleagues uh, extracts from the first witness statement. I'm very grateful. So those are because I uh, um, and I'm sorry about the short notice that we um, that we shouldn't be passing matters up to you. Um, can I just ask whether all members of the court have those pages? Well, the email was copied to our respective clerks, so I'm sure they will. We can do it shortly if they haven't already. I'm very good. So, what, what, if I can just explain quickly what those are. Uh, they are uh, additional pages from the first statement to be inserted in the supplemental bundle at pages 165.1 yeah. to 165.4, and then an additional page 166.1. Just give uh, 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 your lordships and, uh, and and my lady the, the relevant paragraphs uh, to uh, read in relation. Yes. To what's the point? The point, point is that these are the parts of uh, Mr. Uh, Weiss's <coughs> first whip statement. Yes. Which relate first of all to the, his dealings with Mr. Kovitz and then. The, the authorizing by Mr. Kovitz of Mr. Weiss to, yes. to, to consign to summaries. Yes. And so relevant to the, to, to the, relevant to the privacy point, uh, and also in relation to partnership. And the point okay. being, as Mr. Pillow has uh, explained and made submissions on, I'm not going to repeat that this is evidence which, in the event, was adduced by Fairlight, and which therefore they are, they are stuck with. So Fairlight adduced the first witness statement. Device under a hearsay notice. Uh, and uh, can I just give the, the paragraphs, the relevant paragraphs are uh, paragraphs 93 to 97, 101 to 103, 106 to 107, 109. And then 113, particularly importantly, 113 to 116, uh, which are the paragraphs in which Mr. Weiss said, describes how he was keeping in touch with Mr. Coates, keeping him informed of all developments in close and regular contact, uh, describing to him uh, the discuss his discussions with Sotheby's. Uh, and then the uh, and then getting approval from Mr. Coates uh, to uh, uh, and Mr. Coates's agreement uh, to uh, uh, enter into, as he says, rec recommended uh, the, the the deal that was being proposed by Sotheby's, uh, and he recommended to uh, Mr. Coates and Mr. Coates to accept it, and Mr. Coates uh, agreed. So all of all of that material is what falls into the four and a bit lines of paragraph twenty one of the judgment. Uh, page seventy five. Is that, is that where it finds its? where this evidence finds its echo in the judgment. My Lord, yes. But, but, but I would just make two points. A again, one has to look at this in the context of the fact that there was no want of authority issue. So... No, no, there was no spin to my, oh, my question. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying that, that that's, where, that's where all this finds its mark. Yes, in, in, indeed. But... but uh, I, I wasn't. I wasn't suggesting the illogic was spinning. But just in, in, in one, one is one is not look. Just to be clear, one is not looking in this regard for uh, an issue in relation to which there was contention, uh, because it wasn't disputed by Fairlight that they had authorized to uh, authorize. Yes. Uh, Mr. There wasn't. There was an authority issue. Um, in this sense, that the, there was no dispute that MWL had authority to uh, uh, 
bind Fairlight. The dispute was whether or not it had authority to enter into any contracts um, with Fairlight as principal. So, and that comes to my second point, <laughs> which, which is that uh, co correctly analyse what that must mean that, that that is actually a dispute about the effect of contracts A and B. Not, not, a, not about uh, uh, not not a want of authority issue in relation to the, the, the making of a contract, and and that's why the the, the privacy, as, I, as I'm trying to say in terms of my open submission, the, the privacy issue has to be addressed by looking at contracts A and B and analysing who who are the principals to it. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe I got the wrong end of the stick yesterday. Mm -hmm. My impression from. Mr. Collins's very skillful submissions to us was that it really was ultimately a big question as to how much authority, so to speak, there was. I, mean, I understood him to be arguing for a very minimalist view that the only authority was to bring about a situation where ultimately um, the vendors would be bound by contract B for the ultimate purchases. And that's why, certainly yesterday evening, it seemed to me very significant to, to find and read the cross examination of. Um, Mr. Kovitz himself, where he said he'd given carte blanche to MLW to enter into contract A on his behalf. I mean, that at the moment, or then anyway, seemed rather to be a, a key point. Now you're rather telling me all oh, that's really rather irrelevant because there was never an issue with I, it. I, I, Lord, I'm, I'm, not going to, I'm, not, I'm not pushing back on that, um, and certainly not going to get a kick balls in the mouth, but um, uh, and and I would make two points. One is, it's not only Mr. Coe's evidence in that regard, as I said. Yes, it's indeed. Also, 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 indeed yeah. It's referred to in paragraph 22 specifically, having read the evidence judge. of Mr. Weiss. Yeah. It, 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 exactly so. So I'm, I, I, I'm not, as it were, one hand showing all that material and then immediately saying, but, but, but don't, um, uh, don't, uh, don't pay any regard to it, uh, or suggesting that, it, that, it, that it's not admissible or something of that sort. But the point I make is that the, the origin the, the origins of the no privacy case come from Fairlight pleading that the that contract A was entered into with its consent, with its knowledge, uh, knowledge and consent, but then characterising it as a sub-agency agreement, mm. and it is from there that they then build this. Uh, this idea that it is just it, it is just a sub agency agreement and therefore saying no privacy. Uh, and because Mr. Pillay says the relevant question is did Fairlight implicitly or expressly authorise MWL to come to terms with Sotheby on terms that bound the owners together? So he puts it a, diff a different way to you. At least he did already. Uh, Yes, there is there, there is a slight difference there, not not in a way that matters for the purpose of the privacy point, uh, but of course th there is um, there is and was uh, the, the the difference uh, between um, sorry the so Sotheby's has has additional issues to had additional issues to deal with that trial because. Um, of the in, in relation to the GAV point and the difference between contract A and B, mm -hmm. the privity point in relation to NWL's position, we, we is and our position is identical with, with, with Sullivan on this, it is simply whether uh, uh, whether, whether Fairlight was co-principal uh, with, uh, with with NWL to the uh, uh, to to the contracts. Uh, and the point, can I just show you? Yes, can I just can I just show you uh, the, the point I'm making that about the uh, Fairlight pleading uh, that the consignment agreement that contract A was made uh, with Fairlight's knowledge and consent, but then building on it uh, the idea that it was limited to, to sub-agency. 
you can see that uh, best from the from Fairlight's uh, defence. So this is core bundle uh, tab 16. of the issue, and you say effectively it's just a piece of shape shifting, um, but um, they're, the two, they're the same thing. The, the process that is going on is, is the same thing, not two completely different contractual exercises. Not two different contractual exercises, not, not different facts, uh, and, and so the, the, the question is, they, they, char they characterise these two contracts, uh, or sorry, not two contracts, they contract, sorry, because paragraph 11 is contract. A, and you'll see paragraph 14 is, is contract B. So you've got, so there's no difference, there's no difference in terms of the contracts that are being addressed. There's no issue about authority. The question, the privilege question, therefore, is well, what is what is the correct Analysis of who. Yes, the so what the judge was rejecting was the um, was yeah. the attempt to separate eight from eleven and fourteen. Exactly. Right. And I, I suppose one reason it might ended up confusing certainly me is that paragraph eleven on one reading could be interpreted narrowly as saying that the only consent given was to the employment of some of these as a sub agent, um, and that anything and if that's not the right so to speak, analysis of what contract A was doing, then there wasn't consent to anything else it did. Well, yes. Maybe um, another way of putting it is that what Fairlight was saying, was trying to build an argument on, was, was by trying to say, yes. Fairlight never consented, never authorised it to be made principal to a contract. Yes, that's, yes. What I, that's how I understood it. But if you put, if you put that alongside I apologise if I'm circling back to where I started. But if you put that alongside, but yes, Fairlight accepts mm. that it authorised and, and it, it authorised 
the sale of the painting. It authorized the, the conclusion yes. of that deal with Sotheby's. But the, 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 two, the, the two can't sit together. Effectively, you're saying they really are trying to have their cake and eat it. They're going to have it both ways simultaneously. And, um, it's not usually a good idea. It, it, it isn't, and and that's why ultimately um, we said uh, and say uh, that the that uh, in circumstances where there was whoops, the other way, once fair light, as they did from the start of the proceeding, um, accept that. Uh, a sale of the painting had been effected by Fairlight and NWL as co-owners to EPC Nevada through these two agreements. Private question. Sorry? Was that Latin? <laughs> sorry. Mrs. Yes. Oh, you know better than that. From the third, from the third row. I don't know yes. That's it. <laughs> that was that. Was that, that, that Cadet question? Yes. yes. Well, that, that would appear on the transcript. <laughs> so, uh, we will, uh, I'll send an email to the trust. Well. I apologise. <laughs> some, sometimes the shorthand is. Uh, uh, my lords and ladies, that was uh, uh, all that I uh, uh, wanted to uh, say on uh, privacy. Uh, I, I uh, and, and this. Uh, further matter to raise in me in that regard. On partnership, I think I can be uh, even shorter uh, in, in view of um, in terms of those uh, very detailed uh, submissions on this. And all I want to do is actually just to identify uh, one or two uh, uh, references or uh, additional points of, uh, of relevance. Uh, but, but first of all, um, In terms of the scope of the issue that the judge uh, had before him, uh, the position, uh, 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 the position on the partnership uh, as a as a ground of appeal in, in our submission was relatively straightforward. There, there was no dispute on the law before the judge. The position uh, was and is uh, that uh, an agreement between a dealer and an investor, and it would, that would be the correct characterization, not, not the client or a client, an agreement between a dealer and an investor to buy a single painting together uh, as an investment with a view to both of them making profit and to share those profits 50-50 and to share the costs is certainly capable of being a partnership. The question for the judge to consider uh, on the evidence was whether it was a partnership uh, in this case. Now, the question didn't arise uh, for decision, but the judge said that if it had done so, he would have found that it was a, a partnership. Uh, in relation to the range of facts uh, to be considered in, in that regard, uh, it, 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 and even accepting uh, that there are that there were facts that might be said to and were said by the parties to point uh, both ways. Um, uh, th those were the matters that the judge had to uh, take into consideration. I, I would, first of all, just uh, point out that in relation to the fact that this was a single painting uh, and the extent to which it suggested that that was somehow a fact pointing away from partnership. Uh, it's perhaps just worth uh, noting, I don't think this is in dispute in terms of the legal position, uh, but, it, but it's worth noting that in the Partnership uh, Act, That's 32B. 32B. Yeah. Uh, 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 which, which, which shows in relation to uh, uh, dissolution Uh, that uh, a, 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 a partnership 
partnership agreement entered for a single adventure or undertaking will, uh, that the partnership will be dissolved by the termination uh, of the adventure or undertaking and shows a clear contemplation uh, of the uh, possibility and of it being perfectly appropriate for uh, a partnership agreement to be made expressly or impliedly uh, in relation to a single adventure or undertaking. Uh, and in relation, uh, in that context, we uh, uh, say and, 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 and said at the trial that uh, in relation to uh, this, this kind of uh, venture uh, in circumstances where the agreement was made as to the profit sharing and the sharing of costs, that was perfectly uh, appropriate. Uh, again, in, in relation to points that are said and that we emphasized by my then friend for Collins uh, yesterday, uh, said to point away from partnership. Um, uh, my then friend, Mr. Collins, um, uh, seemed to be, or I think was, was suggesting uh, that the difference between Mr. Uh, Weiss or MWL as a dealer and Mr. Coates or Fairlight uh, uh, as uh, an investor is somehow a pointer against partnership. Now, first of all, there's the point that my friend Mr. Cohen made, which is uh, it's not correct in any event to characterize Mr. Coates uh, as, uh, uh, as participating in this uh, venture as a client uh, of the dealer and client uh, relationship. Uh, they were they were co-owners. They were um, buying, uh, bought together and sell it, selling together. But secondly, in relation to the different nature of, of them in terms of their businesses, that actually is a factor that one would commonly see as the reason for making a partnership, because it's a combination of uh, partners bringing different things to the partnership. In one case, one is bringing uh, money, the finance, to enable the transaction to, uh, be, uh, to be done. And on the other, uh, Mr. Weiss, the, uh, the dealer having the expertise uh, in relation to the uh, art market with a view to finding a buyer. Uh, and I should just correct an important, important, this is an important point for, uh, for my client. Not, not correct to say that this was a situation where uh, MWL and Mr. Weiss were, were coming to uh, this uh, to, to this painting uh, no, not with an, an expertise. He's, uh, Mr. Weiss is an old master dealer. This is dealt with in his, in his first witness statement. Uh, not with his expertise, not confined to uh, Stuart and Tudor. Tudor. And in fact, as is described in his witness statement, he had uh, Previously sold a, a, another uh, house. Uh, e each of the uh, the matters uh, uh, and the factors that were uh, described by uh, my friend Mr. Collins yesterday, which he suggested pointed against partnership, are uh, matters which are entirely consistent with partnership, uh, or in fact pointing favourably. The e even the, uh, the the suggestion that. Um, uh, it's significant that uh, Mr. Coates uh, was changing his mind as to uh, uh, whether to uh, the, the painting should be held or whether he would buy out. That's not inconsistent with the partnership, bearing in mind that his uh, his conception uh, and the purpose uh, of the uh, partnership uh, was with a view to profit, uh, and <coughs> that um, uh, and therefore. From, a, from an investment perspective, uh, that could be achieved either by sale of them together uh, uh, or by one partner buying out the, the other. And so the uh, uncertainty of uh, that doesn't point it against partnership. Uh, so, sorry, it's not inconsistent with a common view to making a gain. Not in, no, it, it actually is just another way, it's just showing that there is another way of making a gain. Um, and then can I just, I think lastly on this point in relation to this point, just deal with the draft agreement, uh, which uh, my friend Mr. Collins referred to. Now, uh, this is, um, this, this is uh, interesting because uh, what, 
has been maybe lost now in the uh, in, in the mists uh, of the uh, of the case is that uh, Fairlight's position on the draft agreement actually started out pleading uh, that an agreement had been made uh, on the terms of the draft uh, agreement. The core bundle, if you would go to the reply in the part 20 proceeding. If I'm also going to make a criticism of paragraph 31, it might be more accurate to say Fairlight pleaded rather than Fairlight suggested. Yes. Um, uh, and, and, and indeed, uh, uh, I haven't checked the transcript, but though this point was developed in Fairlight's written uh, in, in Fairlight's closing submissions, uh, which you have. 
have in the supplemental bundle at, at tab 24. Partnership is dealt with at page at paragraphs eight and following. Page four two two four two four. There, uh, there was nothing uh, about maintained about any suggestion that an agreement had been uh, concluded on the terms of the draft. If you go to tab 21, uh, you have our skeleton argument for the trial. And if you would go to paragraph 20, Originally, in, in our defence, uh, 
do the correcting. Uh, uh, MWL pleaded uh, that the that contract B was the contract of sale, and that therefore it was contract B, including the version of GAV that includes the proviso, that applied to the relationship between Sotheby's and the current owners. And Fairlight simply adopted MWL's case. So when, uh, after we had settled, the uh, position, certainly as, as a matter of the pleadings, as, as I understand it, is that Fair, <coughs> Fairlight's case as to why the provider why was included was simply that they were saying, as uh, by, by reference to MWL's plea, the originally pleaded case, uh, that it was contract B that applied to, to the sale rather than contract, uh, well, rather than contract A applying to the position as between. Unless uh, was one further, those are part. Thank you very much, Mr. Soha. Yes, my lords, my ladies. Um, I'll start with one uh, discrete point. Um, question of how title passed, because again, it has been revealed to me that there's an inconsistency in Fairlight's pleading, and no matter how hard I think about it, it's an in inconsistency I can't um, well, you're not responsible. explain or, 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 or defend, because the inc it, I, I drew your attention to the passages where Sotheby's pleaded that title passed pursuant to contract B, and that had been clearly um, accepted, admitted <coughs> by um, Fairlight without any qualification. Uh, I also drew your attention, and as did Mr. Pillow, to the paragraph where it was asserted that the, author the authenticity guarantee was given by Sotheby's as sub-sub-agent, so not, not as principal, but as sub-sub-agent for Fairlight and sub-agent, sorry, too many subs there, as sub-agent for Fairlight and as agent for, um, uh, for, for Mark Weiss Limited. Um, so g given that it was common ground on the pleadings that title passed, pursuant to contract B. Uh, the question then arises, well, why or how? And there is, of course, only one answer to that. Uh, the only correct answer is that Fairlight is party to contract B. So if it's not party to contract B, contract B can't take title of the painting from Fairlight and give it to Nevada. Um, contract B was a contract that Sotheby's expressly entered into, quote, as seller's agent. Unquote. So it was a disclosed agency. It's not a case of undisclosed agency. But even, if, even if it was, I'm not sure that would make any difference to the analysis. It was disclosed but unnamed hmm. principle. Um, but my lord, so, so I accept that I, I, I'm not, um, I, I'm deviating from the pleading, but, but there's nothing wrong with that because all I'm, all I'm doing it's been, is the, the other parties say that Fairlight was party to contract B. And I'm admitting that. So I'm, I'm dropping an argument rather than raising a new point by asserting that Fairlight was co party to contract B. And that must be the correct analysis. The only question is, is it also party to contract A? So as of now, that's a concession that you're a party to contract B. But, well, I have to make that from when I tried to trace it through the pleadings, looking at what was alleged and looking at our response, uh, I, my initial reaction was that that was actually in already a concession, and then I realised I'd missed part of the pleading in which a, a contrary position was taken. I mean, I think it's an inevitable concession because otherwise yes. one is left with a conundrum. How does one account for the admitted fact that title did well, pass? Well, also, I mean, it, it must be right. This, I mean, it, uh, we assert that title passed pursuant to contract. So your task is to establish how, as a party to contract B, you are not at the same time party to contract A. Yes, and and. And, and also, and that's where these sub-agency cases come in. And, and in fact, the sub-agency cases are, are clear you, it, that the sub-agent does create privity as between the ultimate third party and the ultimate principal. But it doesn't follow from that, that there is privity between the principal and the sub-agent. And that's the whole point of those authorities. Um, so. 
The point is, um, the subagent can, in this case, did create privity between Fairlight and Nevada, but it doesn't follow automatically that Fairlight was also party to contract A. So I think I think if I say it doesn't follow automatically, that far is fairly uncontroversial. The question is, was there privity in this case? And of course, the reason why my well, friend Mr. Pillow said, well, if you accept your party to B, then you get to the same result anyway. But my lord, that's wrong. The, the claim in this action is a claim by Sotheby's under contract mm -hmm. A, and specific clauses in contract A, against Fairlight. It was against MWP and Fairlight. Fairlight, it's now just against Fairlight. So if we are right that we're not party to contract A, then Sotheby's has no claim against Fairlight. The correct analysis was as follows. Now, if, if there was no defense to rescission under contract B, so assume that we are wrong about the GAV clause, then the consequence was that Nevada had a claim against my client, Fairlight, for return of the price. And my learned friend keeps on saying, oh, it's Sotheby's balance sheet. They had an obligation. But I do ask you then to look at the terms of contract B. As contract B is very clear. It doesn't say that Sotheby's will repay the price. It says the owner will repay. So Sotheby's, as agent for the owner, has the authority to rescind the contract, just as it had authority to make the contract. But the owner is then the party that's obliged to repay. So at that point, Nevada could have brought a claim against uh, Mark Vice Limited and also against Fairlight as the owners who were privy to the contract, contract B. Now, if Sotheby's itself pays Nevada rather than leaving it to Nevada to pursue Fairlight and MWL, then Sotheby's remedy is to recover from the party to contract A. We say and that is clearly Mark Weiss Limited. The question is, is it also Fairlight? Now, assume that I am right, and Mark Weiss Limited is the only party to that contract. Mark Weiss Limited is potentially liable to repay the full <coughs> sum. But then originally it got paid the full sum. It, it got paid the full sum. It transferred half to Fairlight. It's now liable to repay the full sum. And in, ordinarily, I mean, I'm not conceding this point, but then as agent who has incurred a liability in the performance of its duties, it would then look to its principal to be reimbursed. So, so that's, we say, the correct contractual analysis. There was a chain of authority. And if Sotheby's was entitled to pay Nevada pursuant to the authenticity guarantee, its remedy was against Mark Weiss Limited. And Mark Weiss Limited's remedy was against my client's Fairlight. Now, Forgive me for interrupting mm. your flow, um, Mr. Collins, just quickly. Uh, I've just briefly in contract B. You said look carefully at the wording. Mm. Where, where does it say the owner will, the seller will repay, or, or, or the offer to rescind? I've just had to end the day and it's blank. I so can't I will blank, just I can't find it. get that up. So I'm very sorry. Uh, no, no, that's that. That's why I, I certainly don't want to um, leave with you being not satisfied on that point. The, it's on, so contract B, I'm using the version of the supplemental mm. bundle starting at page 85. Over the page on page 86, yeah. so paragraph four, it's the second part of that. Yeah. Notwithstanding the gener generality of the preceding paragraph, in the event yeah, that and Sotheby's- And the owner will return the factory. Yes, uh, yes, that's, that's it. Thank you. So, so it's Sotheby's that gets to make the determination yeah. as agent for the owners just as it's Sotheby's that entered into this contract mm -hmm. as agent for the owners, but it's owners who have the liability to repay. Yeah. Thank you. So what we say with this contractual mm -hmm. chain, if Sotheby's chooses to pay itself, which it clearly did in this instance, it then looks to the party with which it contracted, Mark Weiss Limited, and the terms of contract A to ascertain whether or not it is entitled to recover from that party, and then Mark Weiss Limited 
can look to Fairlight for its share. What the contractual chain does not permit is for Sotheby's to pay Nevada and then proceed directly against Fairlight. Now, in this case, what happened is, is it settled with Mark Weiss Limited, and it must live with the consequences of that. It can't, it can't have a claim against my client simply because it's settled. If, if I'm right, its only claim is against Mark Weiss Limited. It settled it, and it can't bring a claim against Fairlight. That, that settlement, the fact that it settled for less than 100% what it might have been entitled to recover, is not itself a reason to find privity between Sotheby's and Fairlight. Now, my learned friend says the sub-agency cases do not apply principally for three reasons. First, he said, if Fairlight authorizes the consignment to Sotheby's, then that excludes the application of the authorities. And he also said, because Sotheby's undertook personal obligations, that is sufficient to exclude the authorities. Uh, and I accept I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said here. And a third point he took was that Mark Weiss Limited was not, in fact, delegating its own authority at all. I'll just deal very briefly with those three points. The answer to the first point uh, it, it is addressed in the authorities. And, and we looked, for example, at the Prentice case. The fact that the principal specifically authorizes the agent to appoint the sub-agent is not itself sufficient to create privity between the principal and the sub-agent. And that's the whole point of the sub-agency authority. There needs to be more. You need the precise, precise proof, a proof going to the precise question, did the principal authorize the agent to create privity as between principal and sub-agent? So far as personal um, I'll just give you the reference that we don't need to take it up. It's in uh, Authorities Bundle, uh, mm. Tab 3, Prentice, at page 329, Column 1. So far as the second point is concerned, Sotheby's undertaking personal obligations. Again, that is answered by Prentice as well, because in that case, the London brokers were personally liable for payment of the premiums to the insurance underwriters. But it didn't mean that there was privity of contract between them and the ultimate principles, the insureds. They had to, and in fact did, look to the intermediate brokers, the New York brokers, to recover um, what they claimed, their, their, their loss, which was effectively having paid the premium and not, not recovered it from the owners. So uh, again, the reference to that, it's in page 334, column 2, where you see the analysis and the conclusion that the London brokers were personally liable to the insurers for the premiums. Uh, the real question, the real issue here is issue 3. Was this, in fact, a case where Mark Weiss Limited was delegating the authority it had been given to sell the painting? Or, conversely, was it in fact being authorized to conclude a contract between Fairlight and Sotheby's? Um, my lords, uh, you've now um, had your attention drawn to the relevant passages in the cross-examination of Mr. Collins. And, and it is worth um, looking at those passages carefully to see, firstly, what was put to him, and secondly, what the answers were. And my lords, those are, they're found in the supplemental bundle two, tab 26. Starting on page, I mean, four, five, six. And I won't, I, I don't want to go through this line by line because obviously you can, you, you, I think, have uh, read this already uh, and no doubt will again if you consider it necessary or helpful. But on page 456, if, if we start on the right-hand column at the top, uh, you see the question, you should there see the email that you sent to Mr. Weiss on 17th of May? Yes. Is right that it gave him authority to sell, as it were, the Fairlight half of the painting, as well as the Mark Weiss limited half? Yes. So there the question is, you gave him authority to sell your half? The answer is yes. And I, again, I don't want to... I don't, I don't, I'm not, I want to accelerate. I don't, if you think there's anything important I'd jump over, please sort of pull me back. But 
then below the hole punch, um, there's, there's a reference of just, well, let, I'll just summarize. There's a reference to the 12 million limit. And then at line 24 in the right-hand column, page 99, internal page, uh, you have now an offer comes in. We see that the offer came in from the bottom of the page from Sotheby's forwarded to you by Mr. Weiser further up. This was a proposal to consign the paintings for sale by Sotheby's to a Sotheby's client, wasn't it? Now, now pausing there, consignment, although Mr. Um, Kovitz had indicated that he wanted to be consulted in the event of any consignment, consignment by Mark Weiss had been contemplated in the original authority to sell. That's the 17th of May email, because there was express reference to it. And here what you see is him being consulted consistently with the authority that he gave earlier in May. And then, the, then it goes on. So he answers, yes. Uh, can I suggest the offer would have needed your authorization in two respects? It's below 12 million, and it involves consignment to a third party. And he accepts both of those, because those are, of course, the two qualifications or the, or, or the limitations that were included in the 17th of May email. So what you have is Mr. Weiss pursuant to that authority, coming back saying, well, can I sell for less than 12 million? And can I consign it to Sotheby's for that sale? And you spoke to Mr. Weiss about this offer, didn't you? Yes. And if we go to the 21st of June, we have, as it were, secondary evidence of an agreement that had been reached. Can I suggest that that would have followed on from you providing your agreement to Mr. Weiss on behalf of Fairlight, in your case, to do the deal on this basis? It implies that, and I think that is indeed the case. So. What, what's the deal that's being referred to? The deal that's being referred to, if you look a few lines further up, is a sale to Sotheby's client by Sotheby's. So, because that's the sale for less than the 12 million. So Mr. Weiss says, well, I want to, I want to give it to Sotheby's so, so there can be a sale to Sotheby's client by Sotheby's. And he's, he says, yep. Sorry, sorry, is that right? I mean, it's, one has to be a bit careful, it's not a statute. Um, the, the deal is the proposal to consign the paintings for sale, but you say it's the deal was just the sale. Well, well no, because it, it, I accept it involves consignment to Sotheby's. That's, this, and, yeah. yeah. But, but it's, it's for sale by Sotheby's to a Sotheby's yeah. client. You're proposal not, it's not, to consign the paintings for sale. Mm, yeah. And the reason why specific additional authority is required is because of the terms of the 17th email, say, got to be above 12 million, consult me if there's going to be a consignment. But agreeing to that is not the same. So, so agreeing that your agent can give it, consign it to somebody else for them to sell to their client is simply agreeing to the, what you might call, delegation by Mark Weiss Limited to Sotheby's. It's really no different from the, the, one of the cases referred to uh, in Prentice, where the wheat is consigned to one party to sell and then consigned to another party for them to sell. I'm not suggesting Sotheby's enter into the sale as principal. No, 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 it, it would be understood. I mean, it's clear what's meant here. It's, it's Sothe a sale by Sotheby's. Obviously, a Sotheby's is going to be acting as agent. Well, who are they going to get? They're going to the agents and the owners in that case, isn't it? Yes, but if, they, if, if Mark, Weiss is say, Mark Weiss has authority to sell, and then Mark Weiss wants to actually give it to Sotheby's to sell, Sotheby's is agent of Mark Weiss and sub-agent of Fairlight. Anyway, that, 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 yeah. that, that, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think the passage uh, my lord was referring to perhaps this morning is at uh, internal page 102. Yes. At page 457. Yeah. Where starting at about um, line 13, you left it to Mr. Weiss to sign up to it, didn't you? Yes, I delegated as far as I'm concerned, the whole thing was delegated to Mark. I said I want to be notified or before committed to a consignment of this nature, just because I wanted to understand what his logic was or whatever. But so it was a delegation process. And then the question comes back. I think you used the word delegation three times there. It's fair to say you've come to understand the word may have a legal significance. Actually, I don't know. No, I don't, don't really know what it means. By delegate, what I mean is I transfer to him, that's the word, the authority to do what he saw fit in his judgment. So 
because he's, he's already said, you, 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 Mark Weiss Limited, have authority to sell. And here he's just saying, well, as to how you sell, I'm leaving it up to you, Mark Weiss Limited. I mean, I want to be consulted because I want to understand your logic, but ultimately I'm leaving it to you. And, and that, we say, is not um, sufficient to create privity because what you don't have here is precise evidence going to the point, well, were you agreeing that Mark Weiss Limited could actually enter into a contract with Sotheby on behalf of Fairlight? Yeah, clearly, but no, it's common ground that, that there was that authority. You mean on behalf of Fairlight as principal? Well, on behalf, yes, rather than in the performance of your I understand authority to sell. I understand common yes. ground yeah. that authority was given to MWL to contract on behalf of Fairlight. The issue is whether or not the authority yeah. was to contract, contract on behalf of Fairlight Quay as, as principal. Yeah. And that, that's, there's nothing there where, there's nothing to suggest whether you are bringing, you know, if Mark Weiss said, I want to sign, for example, what would have been clear? If Mark Weiss had said, well, I want to enter into a contract uh, with Sotheby's on behalf of Mark Weiss Limited and Fairlight, if the answer had come back yes, then that would be exactly what the authorities say you need to create privity so it's between a Fairlight. Of all circumstances, one can imply, is that the position? Well, yes, I mean, obviously, you, 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 you're not necessarily constrained by the precise words that are used, absolutely. No, the, uh, but you the, have the, to find. The, the outcome of this, as I understand it, is that you say that you're not a party to contract A, which is a contract signed by your co owner, <coughs> but you are a party to contract B. Which yes. is a contract not signed by you. Yes. Why should that be? Well, it, it, except you, to get there, you are looking through the agency, sub agency. No, but I mean, just on, on any. But on, because on any understanding of life as it is, why, 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 why should it be that you're a party to a contract that your co owner hasn't signed? You're not a party to one that he has. Mm. Well, because it, now, so far as the co the, the co ownership it makes it perhaps conceptually more complicated. But actually, what we're concerned about here is Fairlight's interest. And and I, I agree that it, it's easier to analyse if there's no co ownership. If it was just 100% owned by Fairlight, you'd say, "You, Mark Weiss Limited, please sell this painting for me." Mark Weiss says, "I want to consign it to Sotheby's." You say, "Yeah, okay." And he, Mark Weiss Limited enters into a contract with Sotheby's, and Sotheby's then sells it. That, the the sub-agency authorities are clearly engaged by that fact pattern. And there is no contract between um, Fairlight and Sotheby's on, 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 in that scenario, even though there is, ultimately, between Fairlight and Nevada. Because you have a chain by which Sotheby's, Sotheby's authority comes through the chain so Fairlight, Mark Weiss Limited, Sotheby's, but when it exercises that authority, it creates privity between Nevada and Fairlight. The, the, the question is, does the fact that Mark Weiss Limited is a co-owner make a difference? Now, I accept that insofar as Mark Weiss Limited is selling its own interest in the painting, it is in a contractual relationship. Could, could I take out the co-ownership mm. then, as you, mm. as, as you seek to? But it may be that this doesn't take us anywhere, but I just, it just feels very counterintuitive to me if, um, if this is the, the correct analysis. But let's suppose uh, no, there's no co-ownership, mm. as you, as, as you yeah. say, but nevertheless, um, your business associate, mm. you say, Mr. Mr. Weiss, signs contract A, yeah. But he doesn't sign contract B. But nevertheless, you end up a party to B, not to A. Yeah. Now, well, how, how, how does that play? Well, it depends on the nature of the authority given by me to my business associate. If, if it's, please go away and sell this for me, and then he engages someone else to sell it, then that's where the sub, -author the sub agency authorities apply. Because, and if, if it is, please go away and find somebody to sell it for me. So please go away and point Sotheby's or, or, or Christie's or wherever it is. 
then I'm giving him authority to conclude a contract between me and Sotheby's or Christie's. So in that situation, there is privity. But, and here what we say is if you look at the 17th of May email, and, and you also look at this passage of cross-examination, what you see is an acceptance of the fact that there's an authority is given to sell the painting. Uh, there are limits on that authority. That's why Mark Weiss has to come back and say, well, actually, I want to sell it for less than 12 million, and I do want to consign. But my clients agreeing those limits being removed from the authority that was previously given doesn't change the nature of the authority that was given to Mark Weiss Limited, which was, was, was authority to sell rather than authority to enter into a contract with Sotheby's or Christie's. Thank you. So, uh, uh, and, yeah, so um, that's all I need to to um, say about that. Um, just just one, one discreet point before I move on. Uh, my own friend, Mr. Pillow, said uh, that the pioneer container <laughs> principles were sui generis. That, 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 that's simply wrong. I mean, in Henderson and Merritt, the same issue arose in an agency, sub-agency situation. Because one of the arguments made by, in, where you had the indirect names, one of the arguments run by them was, well, we're going to rely on the terms of the contract between the managing agents, uh, 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 sorry, the, the members agents. Sorry, I, I'll rewind because I think I've got my own terminology muddled up. Where you had the indirect names, you had the indirect names had, had managing agents, and then the managing agents entered into agreements. Sorry, I've got it wrong again. Sorry. <laughs> so that's that time of day. day. I'll, I'll start again. That's you who finds Lloyd's agency agreements confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the trouble is that half the time the, the managing agent is called an underwriting agent, but I'll, I'll, I'll get the terminology right this third time. You have the names, you have names agents, or, or, or sometimes called combined agents. Yeah. And then the combined agent might then enter into a, a contractual relationship with a managing agent who might also be called the underwriting agent. But in any way, you, ha you have a chain with a name at one end of the chain and the party carrying out the underwriting at the other end of the chain. Uh, and what you had was the, the managing agent saying, well, we want to rely on the terms of our con the contract between us and the, and the names agents. Uh, and so obviously there was no privity. But the House of Lords there don't say, well, you can't rely on that because, because the, 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 um, the indirect names aren't parties to those agreements. What they do is they actually look at the terms and say, well, your exclusions don't apply. Uh, I'll just give you the reference for that. It's, it's, one eight, it's in the uh, it's 182H to 183D, where you see the House of Lords dealing with that issue, not on the basis that they couldn't rely on their terms because of want of privity, um, but simply because the, the terms didn't exclude the liability. And then, and then actually, Lord Goff also recognized that it could apply in a completely different context. For example, we have a, a building owner who employs a contractor, and the contractor then employs a subcontractor the subcontractor then damages the property. Lord Goff recognized that if the owner has consented to the limitation of liability in the contract between the main contractor and the subcontractor, the subcontractor may be able to rely on that. Uh, and the, the passage there is page 195G to 196B. So, so those are, the point I make is those, those, are, those are general principles. And here, if Sotheby's had dropped the painting or spilt acid on it or something and destroyed it, and Fairlight had sued as the owner, Sotheby's would still have been entitled to rely on the limitation clauses in its contract with Mark Weiss Limited, precisely because Fairlight had authorized Mark Weiss Limited to enter into a contract with Sotheby's. And, and even if Fairlight didn't know of the terms before the contract uh, was entered into, as was established in the cross-examination, it would have realized that there likely would be terms. So anyway, that, that's that's... That's all I want to say on that. In relation to GAV, I just want to respond briefly to uh, the point not the point raised in the respondent's notice. What, why does it apply at all? The, the short point is that rescission of the sale contract, that's contract B, was by the terms of contract B. Contract B provided that in certain circumstances, Sotheby's, as agent of the owners, could rescind the contract. Now, they have to be acting as agent of the owners, because the contract of sale 
is between the owners and the buyers. So, so when they rescind, they are, because they can't rescind themselves, they're not the sellers. When they rescind, they are rescinding as seller's agents. And it then provided that in those circumstances, the owners had to return the purchase price. Now, if the GAV clause applied, the offer to rescind did not apply, and Sotheby's had no right to rescind the sale contract. Well, this is common ground. Yes, but that's why we, what's not common ground is what follows. And we say it, it must follow. If, if Sotheby's wasn't entitled to rescind the contract on behalf of the owners, but they did so nonetheless, then the owners can't be liable to refund Sotheby's. It's only if they have properly rescinded the contract uh, that they can have any rights against the owners. So that's all I wanted to say. We say it's, a, it's a short point. Contract B is the contract of sale. That's the one that had to be rescinded, and it can only be rescinded. Uh, if if the terms of contract B allowed it to be rescinded. Finally, just a few works on the subsequent owner point. Uh, my Lord, my lady, it should be apparent from the documents attached to last night's note why we say Nevada was at the time of rescission. Well, actually, yeah, yeah, at the time of rescission, a subsequent owner, and not the original buyer, because Nevada bought the painting. From Fairlight and Mark Wise Limited in June 2011. Uh, six months later, in December 2011, it sold the painting to Mr. Hadreen. And then, about four and a half years later, in July 2016, it bought the painting back from Mr. Hadreen. So, the two documents are built to bills of sale. The first is the sale from Nevada to Mr. Hadreen, and the second. Once, once Mr. Hedrine realizes that he actually wants to send the painting back to Sotheby's and for Nevada to get its money back. Because this is actually, the, the, the transfer is more than five years after the original sale, but the, the, the issue about the authenticity had been raised before the five years. So then Mr. Hedrine sells the painting back to Nevada for the same price, and Nevada seeks to return it to Sotheby's. So now Mr. Hedrine's decision to buy from Nevada was, we have to assume, a, 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 a deliberate and conscious decision. I mean, he, he, for some reason, we don't know what it is, but no doubt there was a good reason why he decided he was going to buy the painting from Nevada. Now, when he did so, uh, he, the, the, the painting was no longer held by the original buyer. He wasn't the original buyer. He was a subsequent owner because he had purchased it from Nevada. And when he sold it back to Nevada, Nevada was the next subsequent owner. Now, now Nevada also happens to have been the original buyer, but its status then is not as original buyer, because it doesn't trace its title simply from the contract B, the contract by which it acquired the, pipe, the painting from uh, Fairlight and from Mark Weiss Limited. Because after that, it sold it to Mr. Hedrine, and Mr. Hedrine has sold it back again. Now, my lady, we say the authenticity guarantee is not something that could sort of metaphorically be brought and brought out again by the simple expedient of returning the painting to Nevada, no matter how many transfers there had been after the original acquisition. If Nevada holds the painting as a subsequent owner, we say the authority guarantee is not engaged. I mean, on, on, on the language, you, you can see when, when you look at it that the, we're now, this is now in, in, in contract A, but it's, it's common ground that this applies. It, it's broken down into, there's three parts, because it says the guarantee will not be assignable. That's not actually, that's not an issue and will only be applicable to the original buyer, so that's the second part, and not to any subsequent owner or owner. So there's the three parts, and, and we say that it doesn't matter that Nevada was, when it first acquired the painting, the original owner, 
Because when it came back to it, subsequent, following, there were two sale contracts to Mr. Hedrin and back to Nevada. When it comes back to it, what is its capacity? Its capacity is as a subsequent owner, subsequent to Mr. Hedrin. Now, the apparent purpose of this clause is to prevent the buyer from passing the benefit of the guarantee onto a subsequent buyer. In short, once the painting has passed to a subsequent owner, the rescission right falls away and cannot be revived. And I, I, I won't work through the, the, the language, the surplusage. I don't, I don't want to labor that point. But if Sotheby's correct, uh, construction is correct, then, then the words and no subsequent owner add nothing to the words only applicable to the original buyer. Because if Sotheby's are right, it doesn't matter how many subsequent transfers there are, so long as the property can be re returned to Nevada for, for, for Nevada to rescind. So if Sotheby's are right, Nevada can effectively pass on the benefit of the guarantee by agreeing that it will simply buy back from whoever ends up with it, it will buy back the painting if the authenticity guarantee in contract B can be exercised. What would and the we problem say, be with that? Sorry? What would the problem be with that? Look, well, we say that the, whole, the purpose of this clause is so that it only, the only person who really has the benefit of it is the original buyer. Yeah, but the, I mean, let's suppose um, we were dealing with arm's length transactions here mm. and not with Mr. Head, the dream, <clears throat> and that it went from Nevada to somebody, third party, and then back. Mm. Uh, because we discussed before that it's got to work for that scenario as well as for the actual. Now, um, the, the, the actual um, statement is that Sotheby's guarantee to the buyer that the property is not counterfeit. Mm. That's the guarantee. Um, and that's of value to Nevada um, for, so that, for example, if they then, if, if, if they were then to sell it on, the balloon was to go up as it did, um, they would face, no doubt, problems with their, with, with their purchaser. Um, w w what's wrong, in a sense, in, in those circumstances with um, Nevada taking it back. Well, there's, there's, there's nothing um, morally repugnant. No, no, no but I mean, they, they, they have Sotheby's guarantee that the property is not counterfeit. Yes, but, but you're right. But then it then goes on to say, you, this, but the sole remedy is this. And it actually, it's not a, an unlimited guarantee. It's your sole remedy. Sotheby's will rescind the sale. And then it then goes on to say, the offer to rescind does not apply in certain circumstances. It's actually quite limited. It's five years, but mm. get the painting back in the same yeah. condition and all the rest of it. Yeah. There's yeah. a whole load of, of restrictions, and this is one of the restrictions. One of the restrictions, um, and this one, this one in, uh, in, in contract mm. A, is that it's, so it's, it's, not, it's only the original owner and not any subsequent owner. So that's, that's making it clear that once Nevada has parted with this painting, then the value it, of the guarantee it, it requires away. an interpretation, which is that um, at the point that it was to part with the painting, it's no longer the original buyer. Yeah. But it, the, the Sotheby's interpretation, which allows Nevada to buy it back, and then also the rescission also is sort of uh, gets, gets rather more complicated then, because of course, it, uh, you have a number of transactions and Nevada ends up with the painting. At that point, it's Nevada's title has to be traced back through those various transactions. So, but it's not... It, to do it's not with title, it's to do with the guarantee. Well, except, except yeah. that the, if, if you have a chain of contracts, so you have three contracts... Yeah. The, but I mean, let's suppose I buy a microwave yeah. oven and I've got mm. a guarantee. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I transfer the microwave oven to somebody else who then transfers it back to me and it goes bust. Mm. Um, why, why shouldn't I um, rely upon the guarantee? Well, that I, mean, I appreciate that the person that I transferred the microwave to wouldn't, under a contract of this sort, be able to do that. But why can't I? 
Well, whether you can or can't will turn on, on the language used in the guarantee. Well, I'm talking about the same guarantee being given to yes. me as the end of my contract. It might depend on the precise nature of the relationship between you and the person to whom you've transferred it. But, it. but in this case, where you actually have a series of sales, then rescinding what, uh, uh, so for example, what's not happened, what's not said is there's no rescission of the contract. In, in 2016, Nevada has acquired, just reacquired the painting from Mr. Hadreen. It's not being said that that contract's rescinded, and then the contract between Mr. Hadreen and Nevada is rescinded, and then the contract between, so it's not through a, a chain of rescission that it's going back to Sotheby's. Their, their case is, well, I can simply buy it back and then rescind. Um, and we say that's what this language is designed to prevent, because otherwise this is a, this is this doesn't does, doesn't achieve anything at all. Anyway, Maud, you, 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 I think you've got my point. <coughs> um, so, my lords, my lady, unless I can be of any further assistance, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Collins. Thank you. Good. Well, I think that concludes the argument. Um, it then it remains to me to thank you all very much indeed, both counsel we've heard from and their respective teams for the excellent written and oral arguments we've heard in this interesting case on which we will of course take time to consider our judgments. And we will follow the normal procedure, I'm sure you know, you will receive them in draft with we'll invite corrections of typos and obvious errors with no re-argument. And we hope you will we'll be able to agree the order to be made, if there are areas of disagreement, please let us have brief written submissions and we will deal with them on paper unless you're otherwise advised. Um, and Pandan will almost inevitably be virtual in current conditions with no need for any attendance. Um, but it has been a great pleasure for us to have a real live hearing um, in these difficult times. So um, that, that and other, I repeat my thanks to all of you and indeed to um, the shorthand writers and everyone else who made a contribution to this hearing. So thank you very much. Well, thank you.
you want to think you all three of you down, which normally I think one of you is. Three cards. 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 Three Yeah. Okay. 